Nick is a C Python core developer and a nominated member of the Python Software Foundation. He is the author uh, or co-author of several accepted uh, Python enhancement protocols, including PEP343, which added the with statement and context managers to the language. He's also accepted a number of PEPs on Guido van Rossman's behalf. Since June 2011, after more than 12 years in the aerospace and defence sector, Nick has been working on internal tools for Red Hat and is now the development lead for Beaker, a full-stack software integration and testing system. Nick is here today to tell us that nobody expects the Python Packaging Authority. I mean, please give it up for Nick Coughlin. Yeah. Yes. No, nobody expects it except people who read the schedule. Um, oops. So, Keith already... Uh, <laughs> Russell already went through most of this. Um, so I'm also the BDFL delegate for packaging related PEPs, which we'll get into more about what that means later. Um, so Python packaging is fine. Python packaging is wonderful. These are probably not the words most people would use. Um, whoops. Uh, so we, we actually get quite a common feedback on New people who are new to Python, particularly coming from other languages and newer languages like uh, Node.js, like going, why is packaging so bad? Um, it would be easy to get defensive and saying, oh, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. The problem is they're not wrong. There's lots of things that are fundamentally broken in the way we do packaging in the Python community. Um, and so instead of saying, oh, no, 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 it's all fine, we don't need to fix anything, uh, instead what we realized it was important to do was say, okay, where are we now? Where do we really want to be? Um, what's stopping us from actually being, being there? Uh, and what can we do about it? Um, and so a lot of the things that are wrong in Python packaging, just a legacy of it being old. Um, the, the core of the current packaging system was laid, was laid when the first disutils commit was made in December 1998. Google Inc. was incorporated in September 1998. Um, so our packaging system is almost predates Google. Uh, oddly enough, the software world has learned a lot about software distribution in the last 15 years. Um, and we haven't really taken advantage of a lot of that. Uh, setup tools and easy install uh, dates from around 2004, which improved a lot of things. Um, but again, still a couple of years before JSON was standardized. Um, and pip, distribute, virtual env, all things from around 2007 to 2009. Uh, and again, they improved a lot of things, but still disutils is there at the core, still 15 years old, still limiting us in a lot of ways, still causing a lot of problems. Um, and so the question then becomes, that's the history, that's how we got here. So where do we want to go? Just because we've been doing it for 15 years doesn't make it a good idea. Uh, and so where we'd really like to get to, we'd like newcomers to Python to have a really clear packaging story, easy to understand, easy for them to get this started, easy, to know for them, easy for them to know what they should be doing, and then have more advanced options as things they can explore later if they hit the limits of the, of the basic stuff. Um, so we want it to be, so we want it to be clear what's the best advice. We want it to be easy to get started. Uh, we want the tools themselves to be fast, reliable, reasonably secure, and I'll get more into that qualifier later. Um, but the other thing we want is we don't want what we do to be a Python silo. We want to be able to play well with others. We want to integrate with the Linux distributions. We want to integrate well with other packaging systems. Um, and so what I'll be doing today is I'll just be going through how we want to, how, what we're doing to try and get to where we want to be. Um, so the first goal, clear authoritative guidelines. What is preventing us giving those guidelines today? And this is actually one of the most complex things uh, because it's a people problem. It, there are some aspects of it specifically related to tools, but predominantly related to people, related to politics, um, and the question of who gets to decide what those guidelines say, what tools will they recommend, where will they be documented, and how do users figure out that these actually are the official guidelines. 
Um, and so the core of the people problem was who can actually say yes to this stuff? We had people wanting to do the work, people wanting to say, hey, I have these ideas for how to make things better. Can somebody please tell me how to make it official? Um, and so Python has a mechanism in place for the core language for de deciding this kind of thing, which is the Python enhancement proposal process. Uh, and that basically is the way Guido Van Rossum says yes to things. Um, now the problem with that is if it's a problem that Guido doesn't care about, then it's really hard to get him interested and sometimes he'll say yes just so people stop bothering him about it. Um, and that's the way packaging has historically gone uh, because Guido just wanted the problem to go away, uh, the rest of the core developers, me included, just wanted the problem to go away and so we said yes uh, to things that we probably shouldn't have said yes to because they just didn't work. Um, and so what we've changed this time is I'm basically a lot more directly involved because I've had a lot more to do with packaging in the last couple of years since starting at Red Hat. And I'm one of the ones now going, hey, this is broken. We need to do better. Uh, and we had a couple of people coming in, uh, Daniel Holf and Donald Stuffed, wanting to work on a lot of stuff. Uh, and the PIP developers and the Setup Tools developers, again, wanting to get involved and work on stuff. Uh, and I basically volunteered to say, hey, let's, write, let's have another go at this. Uh, and I'll volunteer to be the one to say, hey, yes, let's do that. So these other guys are doing all the work. Um, uh, the only thing I'm actually doing myself is writing one metadata standard. Um, and that then becomes the linchpin that lets all the new, tool, the new versions of the tools interoperate on different things. Um, and so that basically gives us the power to say yes uh, and makes, let's, let's us channel the energy of all the people involved in productive directions such that we'll actually improve the ecosystem as a whole rather than people going off their separate ways and just creating more fractured communities. Uh, and then Richard Jones has also stepped up uh, to, uh, to be the final decision maker for stuff specifically related to the Python package index. Uh, and that's let us make some substantial improvements there that, have, that we'll uh, get more into later. Uh, one of the other key changes, though, is that the Python enhancement, process, Python enhancement proposal process has historically been targeted solely at the standard library. Uh, and so every PEP had to, have, had to be making a proposal about, hey, this is going to be in the standard library at some point. And it turns out that's a fundamentally broken way of approaching packaging problems because Python 2.7 is still the most widely used Python version. Uh, Python 3.3 is catching up, but is not there yet. Um, and both of them are obviously far more heavily used than the not yet released Python 3.4. So a PEP proposing changes to Python 3.4 isn't really very interesting because nobody's using it, so a packaging tool that only works with Python 3.4, which doesn't exist, what's the point? Uh, and historically, we have tried to do packaging PEPs that way, targeting the next version of Python, and it just doesn't work. So what we've changed this time is the PEPs are not being discussed on Python dev, they're on Disutil SIG, and disutil sig is all about current tools. Uh, it is all about tools that will work with versions of Python at least as far back as 2.6. Um, and the other interesting thing is that if we do this right, people that are already using the relevant tools should not notice any difference on the back end for the stuff they are doing right now. What they should notice is that the tools that they are already using actually grow a few more options and become a bit more reliable and a bit faster. But in theory, we are trying to avoid disrupting what end users actually do, which again is a significant difference from the last attempt at this, which suffered the uptake problem of it required users to change what they were doing. Um, so that's one of the big changes. Um, one of the other big blockers to things being clear, or what what a uh, what prevents things being clear was, hey, should I use setup tools or should I use distribute? Uh, and so distribute was a setup tools fork that came about due to a combination of technical issues and governance issues. 
Um, the important thing from a user's point of view, <coughs> the distribute fork is over. Uh, the distribute fork has been merged back into setup tools. Setup tool 0 0.7 was the first one released under the uh, lead maintenance of Jason Coombs, who's the former lead maintainer of distribute. Uh, and it's now maintained in a Mercurial repo on Bitbucket. And so that, that merger happened first in setup tool 0 0.7. Um, and so the answer now, that unfortunately had some kind of compatibility hiccups. And so setup tool 0 0.8 is the use setup tool 0 0.8. Jason has turned this slide into a lie. Uh, 0 0.8 was released this morning. So, uh, so yes, so in terms of should I use distribute or setup tools, the answer is now use setup tool 0 0.8 or later. Uh, and that's, that's basically the recommended default build system is grab setup tools off PyPI, use that. Um, and that's in preference to disutils as well. So don't use the standard disutils, it's really limited. Um, and so a lot of the issues with setup tools have been fixed through the distribute fork. And it's, it still has a few quirks, but it's still better than disutils. Um, so yes, so that, that is, will now be clear. Pip versus easy install. So again, this was a case where easy install had a lot of problematic defaults. Sysadmins hate it with a passion, and they have good reason to. Um, pip was kind of designed to be a non-broken easy install. Uh, and in particular, you can actually uninstall stuff that pip installs. Um, however, one of the interesting things in easy install that pip didn't adopt uh, is the binary egg format. There's a bunch of complex reasons for why that was a good idea. Uh, on the other hand, egg solved a real problem of binary distribution, uh, particularly lack of binary support on Windows can be a serious hassle, um, just because building stuff from source is uh, so painful there. Uh, and it also, the build step slows things down an awful lot. So what Daniel Holth did was he created a new format. Um, as he puts it, he called it wheel because new egg was taken. And basically, what, it, what that is, is it's a revamped version of the egg format. That pretty much fixes all the reasons why people didn't like eggs. Uh, and integrates better with platform packages, so you can take a wheel, tear it apart, turn it into an RPM, that kind of thing. Um, and what that means is that the upcoming pip 1.4, and this one is still coming soon, they didn't publish this one this morning. Uh, you can download the betas, though. Uh, and what it basically does is it adds the wheel support to, uh, to pip. Uh, and that will eventually replace the, uh, the uh, it makes pip a much better replacement for easy install at this point, because it does have some level of binary distribution support now. And you can do build caching with it and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and then the final, final link in the thing of how, what's preventing us from doing clear authoritative guidelines uh, is who do you believe? Uh, because there's, there's basically some rough history there between different developers fighting with each other as to which direction they thought the packaging uh, ecosystem should go. Uh, there's a lot of the remnants of that online. Uh, and so when you try to search for Python packaging, you'll get a lot of conflicting advice, you'll get a lot of vitriol directed between different groups of developers. Um, and from the point of view of a beginner trying to get started, it's like, what do I do? Who do I believe? Uh, the standard library is no help because it's still all disutils based and basically pretty much packaging, packaging, packaging advice that was, if it was still 2003, would probably be good advice. Um, not so useful in 2013. Uh, and so, who should you believe? You should believe the Python Packaging Authority. Uh, and this was a name that was originally chosen by the PIP and Virtual Env developers a few years ago. Um, they, they, they were mostly just thought it was amusing. Uh, and I, I kind of co-opted it a bit and said, hey, you know what? You guys have a pretty cool uh, group name there. Would you like mind becoming the hosts of all the other tools as well? Um, and so basically that's what we have now. Pip and virtualenv are still on the PyPA GitHub account. Uh, 
but setup tools, the Python package index source code, uh, and a new support library called distlib uh, all live under the PyPA account on Bitbucket. Uh, the, and another project that we're working on is uh, the Python packaging user guide. Uh, and it's not stable yet because we've been waiting for the pieces of setup tools 0 0.8 and uh, pip 1.4 to get into place. Uh, but now that they're either published or very close to published, we'll be able to give clear guidelines in the package and user guide to say, get setup tools 0 0.8 or later, grab pip, grab pip 1.4 or later, and you'll basically have the state of the art in Python packaging tools. Uh, and essentially, once that document is ready, uh, we'll go into the distributing software guidelines on python.org and basically not entirely sure yet how much of that we're going to kill, probably a lot of it, uh, and we'll redirect readers over to the Python packaging user guide instead. Uh, and then that way people will get the newcomers to Python will go to python.org and get the clear redirection say, hey, this info over here is authoritative, this is the best way to get started with Python packaging. Uh, and so, fingers crossed, we will lose the, some of the lament of, ah, what should I be doing? W w there's all this conflicting advice on the internet, which should I follow? And um, we're hoping that the delegation from python.org will, will hopefully make that easier. Um, so that's the documentation side of things and the governance side of things. But still, there's the thing of, how do you actually get bootstrapped into this ecosystem? How do you what does the guide tell users to do to actually get these tools? So, well, pip in the standard library would be an interesting question, wouldn't it? Uh, and so that's basically what we're going to do. Uh, Richard's written a pip, pip439, and what we're not adding the full pip source code to the uh, standard library just because that makes updates a bit too painful. Uh, what uh, Python 3.4 will be able to do, though, is actually bootstrap pip into its own installation. Uh, and so the Linux distributions we expect will just either pre-bootstrap it or just provide it as a normal system package. But the big, the big advantage is on Windows, uh, where you'll be at, and possibly Mac OS X, where you'll basically be able to bootstrap pip in yourself easily enough. Uh, and one of the things that that will probably enable is there's another PEP, PEP 431, which is about improving the time zone support in the standard library. Uh, and one of the problems there has always been about how do we do database updates uh, when the Olson database changes. Uh, and by having PIP bootstrapped in the standard library, then that becomes easy. We just publish an updated package on PyPI that you can download and it'll override those. Uh, and so that'll enable a lot of cool things. Uh, will, it will lower the barrier to entry to actually, um, there'll be, it'll, it'll be a lot easier to have things on PyPI as, hey, don't get, uh, uh, lessen the pressure to get things into the standard library because there's a lot of things where it'd be enormously convenient to have them there, but they're not really stable enough yet. Uh, and so, so yeah, and so that will be hopefully an exciting addition in Python 3.4. But that said, I was saying earlier that we want to do this all ecosystem first. Uh, and a change for Python 3.4 doesn't help people now. And so the big thing we're going to do there is that at the moment, um, it's not really that clear how official the bootstrap mechanisms for setup tools and PIP are. Uh, and for 2.7 and 3.3 and similar releases, we need a story, better story on that front. Uh, and what we're probably going to do is we're probably going to give the scripts that you need to bootstrap those things uh, a home on the Python package index. Uh, and so people will actually be able to get them from PyPI, and PyPI will be saying, hey, look, th this is how you get bootstrapped. Uh, and the user guide will be able to reference that. So the exact details of how that's going to work are still in flux, but we'll do something to make it more obviously official. Um, so that's, that's kind of the newcomer experience, that that's what we want to do to make things easier for people coming into Python. So, but what about once you're actually in, you're using these tools, um, how do we want them to work then? And the goal there is fast, reliable, and reasonably secure. Um, and there's a reason that last one has to be qualified, but we'll get to that later. Uh, so what then is currently preventing fast distribution? 
Uh, the mirroring system for PyPI is quite complex. It's really hard to run a mirror correctly. Uh, and the mirrors are tricky enough that most of the tools don't use them by default. You have to explicitly request them. We have this crazy, crazy system where one of the things that a link can get from the index server is a reference to another page, and it will then go look at the other page for more links. And it will scrape the HTML looking for things that look like releases. This is crazy. Uh, and not only is it crazy, but it's also incredibly slow. So we're making some changes to deal with that. Um, and then the other thing is that the metadata for the dependencies between packages is not ag actually published by the package index. You have to download the entire distribution before you can see what its dependencies are, which is, again, a little strange. So things that have changed recently. Um, PyPI.python.org is now behind the Fastly content delivery network, uh, which Fastly have actually donated that to the PSF, uh, including their logging access so that we can actually maintain the download counts that they were switched off briefly, um, but they're now back. Um, and the advantage of this is though, so it reduces the load on the master Python package index server. Um, it's used automatically, so the tools don't need to opt in or anything. It just happens. Um, and then as you get the whole point of a CDN is you get the ge geographic distribution benefits of the endpoints. So you'll get faster, link, faster ping times, faster downloads. Uh, assuming that all, and that seems to be working pretty well. Uh, and as I said, uh, while we briefly lost the download counts from PyPI, uh, we net with uh, working with Fastly, we have that back. Um, the other one is so yet another pep. It's complex. There's lots of peps. Uh, 438 is about trying to kill off the scanning of external links um, because basically. Yeah, it, it kind of sort of made sense at different times in the, uh, in the evolution of the ecosystem, but at the moment, it's just slowing things down for no good reason. Um, and so all new projects registered with PyPI now have link scanning turned off. They, they will just look for re releases on PyPI. Um, Donald Stuffed has gone through um, and basically scanned all of the uh, packages on the index to say which ones actually needed the link scanning uh, and any of the ones that we could determine definitely didn't need it, the link scanning has been turned off, uh, which, um, and then project authors also have the option to go in and say, no, 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 I really don't need it. You can turn it off. That's fine. Um, and then to supplement that, there's uh, the ability to specify specific external links, which is still not great, but a heck of a lot faster than the old link scanning approach. Um, and so, yeah, the effect of this is, unfortunately, I meant to look up the statistics on some downloads, um, but yeah, things like installs that used to take 20 to 30 minutes are down to like two or three. Um, and with all of that, mostly be down, download time. Because yeah, the link scanning was just adding ridiculous numbers of additional URL fetches and some of the servers that it was hitting were just slow, non-responsive if they responded at all. Um, so yeah, it was causing a lot of speed problems, so killing that off is a very, very good thing. Um, and yeah, we're just having to be careful because there are still some projects that that is the, the external sites is the only way to download them. Uh, and so if we just turned it off completely, we'd break the Python ecosystem. So yeah, we're trying to be careful with a lot of this stuff. We still make mistakes, but uh, I think the the longest disruption was the loss of the download counts, and I think that was only a couple of weeks. Um, for anyone that has a project on PyPI and wants to check that their, their uh, external links have been turned off properly, uh, there's a website at pypi-externals.caremad.io. Uh, and uh, I should have put the link in the slides, but that's all right. Um, so, uh, yes, basically you can go to that and it'll tell you what packages still have lots of external dependencies. Um, and then the other speed factor, another speed factor was the binary distribution with pip. Um, 
Because one of the things you can do when you have a binary format is you can cache your builds. Uh, and so pip 1.4 uh, can do the build caching with wheels. Um, and then back on the point of the index not publishing metadata, uh, this is kind of the focus of the meta metadata 2.0 pips. Uh, we really, really want to get to the index publishing sensible metadata that the tools can consume uh, and just basically speed up a lot of stuff. Uh, as I was saying earlier, the idea is that we will be able to just set up tools to generate this format and pip to consume it, uh, and end users shouldn't notice any difference except for getting some more capabilities that they didn't have before. Um, but yeah. Um, so 15 minutes, huh? Uh, <laughs> So what prevents reliable distribution? Uh, the PyPI server itself used to be quite unstable. Uh, the external hosting adding more points of failure and the complex mirroring system. So PyPI got migrated several months ago now. Um, much, much better systems, much better hosting. Um, the removal of the external link scanning uh, is not only faster, it's actually more reliable. Uh, because it used to be that if any dependency that you had had an external host, and any one of those external hosts was down, your install would fail uh, if you weren't using a caching proxy. Um, and so, yeah, so the CDN is configured so that even if the master server goes down, the CDN should keep serving, which is a nice improvement. Um, so what about the mirrors? Um, so for a very long time, the mirrors did help. Uh, they, 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 they helped with a lot of things. Um, however, the problem more recently is that we've been running into problems with the mirrors getting stale, uh, which is a problem in its own right. So the recommendation at the moment is actually to turn the mirrors off, uh, turn the public mirrors off. Uh, running your own caching mirror is still an excellent idea. Uh, if, you cannot, if you cannot afford to have Pyth the Python package index go down on you, uh, then you need, uh, need to remember that there's no service level agreement for PyPI. It's, it's uh, we, we try to keep it up and make it as reliable as we can, but ultimately uh, running your own caching proxy is, is the thing to do if you can't afford to lose that service. Um, now onto some of the security stuff, which I'm probably gonna have to skip through some of it a bit quicker than I originally planned. Um, yeah, so what prevents reasonably secure distribution? Uh, <laughs> Historically, a lot of this was running over HTTP, um, which made it ridiculously easy to do man-in-the-middle attacks on it. Uh, and basically, it was a problem that we just, the, the world kind of ignored it uh, for a long time and relying on the fact that in terms of attack targets in the software world, there are far more interesting things to attack than the Python ecosystem, such as Windows, Android, OS, uh, iOS. Uh, yeah, there's that said. Uh, RubyGems.org compromise shows that people aren't unaware of the effectiveness of attacking some of these things, so we need to take it seriously. Uh, and there are a few other issues with the way PyPI was configured, um, a few issues with the mirroring system, and we place a lot of trust in the integrity of PyPI itself. Uh, so the things we've changed on PyPI, it now runs with a high assurance SSL cert, uh, courtesy of the PSF. Um, for everything where we could without breaking backwards compatibility, uh, it now forces SSL. Um, unfortunately, some of, the old, uh, some of the old APIs, we couldn't force SSL on them because it would break all the existing clients. Um, and so we're, the setup tool 08 and pip 1.4 both use SSL connections up to, to um, PyPI as well which is another big reason for the, uh, for, to, to want to which switch to the new versions as soon as possible. Um, for some domain issues, we've moved all the docs hosting away from the pypi.org domain onto pythonhosted.org. Um, and eventually, uh, all of python.org will be switched to forced HTTPS. Uh, so there's technical limitations that prevent us from doing that at the moment. Uh, if you go look at preview.python.org, once that goes live, uh, we'll do the forced HTTPS switch at the same time. Uh, and that's just to, basically just to arcane reasons that that's important for securing PyPI itself. Um, so client security improvements will be, they'll all be using verified SSL. Uh, so the interesting question from a security point of view is can you trust the mirrors? 
Uh, if the mirror is serving over HTTP, no. You cannot trust anything served over HTTP. It's just too easy to do a man in the middle attack on it. Um, mirrors that are on HTTPS, uh, you can mostly trust. Uh, your main issue there is whether they're serving you stale data. Um, and that's, uh, yeah. So basically, the simplest trust chain these days, if you're getting stuff from PyPI, is to trust PyPI itself, the Fastly CDN, and then run your own caching proxy. Uh, using the public mirrors, um, while they've given us good service over the years, it's probably not the best option anymore. Uh, and definitely don't trust the ones if they're, if they're only serving HTTP. Um, that brings us to the interesting question of should you trust PyPI itself? Uh, and the, yeah, the short answer is no. Um, so, so there's a couple of reasons why not. Um, so using SSL places a lot of trust in the integrity of PyPI. Uh, it does not give us end-to-end -end integrity of the data path. Uh, so you are trusting that what is on PyPI is what was originally uploaded by the provider of the software. Uh, you are trusting that what the was originally uploaded by the provider of the software is not malicious. Um, you're, and you're trusting that our server hasn't been compromised. That's a lot of trust. Uh, if you can afford it, you, what you really want to do is you want to set up a private mirror and you want to do a security audit on all of your packages. That's not cheap. Uh, it's one of the reasons why Linux vendors get paid. Uh, because that's kind of what we do on behalf of our users. Uh, so, yeah, it's the case of, yes, it is probably okay to trust PyPI up to a point. Um, that point is where betrayal of that trust would destroy your business. Um, and that's probably, and so yeah, there's, Technical things we're looking at to try and improve that trust model. Uh, the update framework looks particularly interesting. However, trusted distribution of software is a really, really, really hard unsolved problem. Uh, Linux distributions haven't solved it properly. Um, they have solved it better than most. Uh, but yeah, it is a really hard problem. And we're basically taking a calculated risk with the amount of trust we placed in PyPI. Um, is that calculated risk worth it? I think so, but it's still a risk. Um, and then the final goal that I mentioned earlier is interoperating with the platforms better. And so if you ask most language developers, hey, cross-platform tools are awesome. I can give my users the same commands on Linux, Mac OS X, Windows. I don't need to care what operating system they're running. My instructions in can stay the same. Uh, if you talk to a system integrator, I think those language-specific tools suck, and we want language-neutral tools because they're awesome. I don't need to care whether it's C, C++, Java, Python, Perl, Ruby, JavaScript, Haskell, Erlang, Rust, Go, yum install, whatever. Um, and the other problem from a system integrator point of view is every new distribution uh, framework you support, oh, look, more security vulnerabilities, more security audits, uh, all sorts of fun, interesting problems. Um, and auditing certifications still matter. Uh, so, as the designers of the ecosystem in the middle, we actually want to support both. Uh, Python-specific tools need to be the default option so that we can give beginners and newcomers easy instructions to say, hey, this is what you do to get, in, get involved. Um, and then the, uh, what, we then is off, what we can then offer is if our metadata is rich enough, then the translation to the platform-specific tools can be automated far more easily than it can now. So at the moment, the, distrib the platform tools, they need to do a lot of careful unpacking to try and figure out what the dependencies are and how to map them to platform dependencies. Um, and so one of the things we're looking at in Metadata 2.0 is including a lot of things to make that easy to automate uh, and to provide the ability for, for us to put platform-specific hints in the metadata without messing with everything else. Um, and then hopefully we can make it so that the Python ecosystem is one that is self, uh, you can use it self-contained uh, and just do live in a pure Python world, manage all your dependencies with the Python tools. Um, but if you want to interoperate with a different packaging ecosystem, then we have the support there for that as well. Uh, and so that tools like pip to rpm 
and uh, whatever the Debian one is, the name escapes me at the moment. Um, and basically that those tools will be able to use the new metadata to produce, uh, produce platform-specific tools far more easily. Um, and yeah, so that is all tied into uh, PEP 426, uh, which is the new metadata standard, uh, and PEP 440, which is just the supporting versioning standard. Um, I'm actually done. So we have extra time for questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, yes, if anyone does have questions, please come down, form a queue at the mics, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll queue up. Just to get the room started. <laughs> um, <laughs> you, um, you, you've obviously, there's been lots of movements made to, or changes made to speed up yep. the, the installation process, putting in CDNs, putting in, uh, 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 removing the downloading process, and so, so on. From a, the perspective of an end user who uses packaging, there's one huge speed up that I can see that isn't obviously there, or if it is, it seems like the solution is install your own local cache. It's on Monday, we're going to start running tutorials in the room, and I'm going to spool up three virtual environments to, test, to teach various people things or test various things, and every single one of them is going to have to download pip and download IPython from the internet, not from the fact that I've downloaded them 40 times in the last month. Um, local, I, I don't know, if, is, is there a, any, is this, a, is this actually a problem? Is it I'm something that I've missed in configuring? Sure or is it one for, it either uses a local cache by default, or you just have to point it at a directory to say cache the wheels here, uh, and it will do a local cache for you. Okay, so that's a rel well, 1.4 relatively recent addition to the whole. Yeah. Ecab, right. Well, of course, it, it, it's dependent on having the wheel format right. as the caching format. Okay. So, so yes, so 1.4 beta is out now, and I'm not sure of the timing for 1.4 itself, but not too far away. Um, so Debian have been doing signed packages for a long time, and everybody was kind of ignoring them, and then the package servers got compromised, and they were able to show that like nobody actually compromised any yes. of the packages. Um, and that's why you, we want to do it. Are you going to follow their route of using um, like GPG and stuff like that? Because they seem to have like solved this problem. Calling the Red Hat and Debian solution solved is an interesting definition of solved. <laughs> uh, solved better than nothing. <laughs> yes, substantially better than what everybody else does, I will grant. Um, there's, there's interesting challenges with key management for the way Debian and Red Hat do things. Yeah. Uh, and the problem we suffer, the problem we suffer for PyPI is that the um, core server itself isn't audited. Uh, and the other problem is that we want the barrier to uh, experimental distribution to be extraordinarily low. Uh, and saying you must learn to manage GPG keys uh, as a as a requirement for being allowed to distribute software through our infrastructure, we're not sure that's a step we're prepared to take. Uh, that said, uh, the update framework is basically a research project that was aimed at systematically solving. Uh, the software distribution problem, uh, and their research is good. They found a bunch of vulnerabilities in the way Red Hat and Debian did things, um, which I believe have since been addressed. Uh, and so what we're likely to do is, at some point in the future, adopt that model uh, and figure out something on the upload end whereby people can trust PyPI to sign on their behalf. Uh, and then at that point, we think we'll be able to solve the entry problem, whereby people can get started easily by trusting PyPI to sign for them. Uh, and then, but larger projects like Django and uh, OpenStack and what have you would be able to take responsibility for their own signing keys. Uh, and um, <laughs> Jacob is telling me, no, no, <laughs> we don't want that. Um, but yes, so the update framework is a really, really nice trust model, uh, really, really good way of doing end-to-end -end signing. Uh, it's just a ways down the to-do list at the moment, because at the moment you couldn't even trust the link from PyPI to the installers. Um, and so once we get the PyPI to install a link sorted, 
then we'll probably start looking more seriously at the um, at the end-to-end -end trust from the developer through to all the way through to the end user. Um, uh, did that include looking at the stuff the Linux kernel was doing with their signed um, like releases on source at all? Or? Haven't looked at the Linux kernel stuff in particular, but okay. Uh, yes, there, there, there's a lot of what one of the reasons one of the reasons we've put off dealing with that problem is there's a bunch of research we need to do before we can solve it, uh, and using SSL as a stopgap basically was, was just a solution that didn't require a lot of research. So definitely a stopgap. Hi there. Um, a lot of people know and love Virtualand at the moment for Python 2. Uh, I know there's PyVM for Python 3. Yep. Do you know much about if they should work together or if you'd like people to move over to uh, no, no, no. PyVM so eventually or how they're supposed to cooperate? People are. Uh, VirtualEnv should work on Python 3 as well. Uh, and basically, VirtualEnv on Python 2 has to do some nasty hacks to try and make itself work. Uh, and the core infrastructure we added in Python 3.3 is basically designed to replace those nasty hacks. Uh, and so VirtualEnv itself, you should be able to just keep using it. Uh, PyVenv just gives you a basic equivalent out of the box. Um, but really, you're probably just better off grabbing VirtualEnv. It does a, lot of, it does a few extra things that are nicer than what PyVenv does. Um, so ma mainly because it gives you pip and setup tools automatically. <laughs> All right, so um, well, so first off, I want to thank you for your work and your leadership in this area. I've been complaining about Python packaging for as long as I've been using Python, and um, I'm actually optimistic now. It's just kind of a new feeling, and it's surprising. Um, <laughs> so my question is, um, it's a little bit in advance of uh, the, the talk I'm going to give next is about the, the OWASP top 10 and how it applies to Python. And um, their, their point number nine on sort of the biggest security vulnerabilities is outdated dependencies. And yes. as I was sort of sitting there trying to think what Python has to offer here, I basically came up with nothing. You have no way of knowing that you know, you're using Django 1.4 and there's a security problem and it's, and it's out there. So I'm wondering about your thoughts about what you think Python and PyPy can do to help users understand that this, you, know, this you is, need to upgrade. This is why we're looking at the update framework. Uh, because the thing about the update framework is that it uh, it is deliberately designed to protect against the stale dependencies problem. Uh, and so basically, uh, yeah, it, it delivers a timestamp file, and that should be getting refreshed every 15 minutes. Uh, and if, so if a client cannot get to that file, uh, or cannot get a sufficiently recent version of that file, then it will throw up its hands and say, hey, something screwy is going on. Um, and yeah, and that's the other reason we want to get the index server actually publishing the metadata, because once you are publishing the metadata properly, particularly in gzipped form, then you can just go grab the metadata for your dependencies and check, hey, are they all fresh? Uh, whereas at the moment, that's just way too expensive, because the only way to check is to go download them all again. Uh, and, that's, and that's just too costly for people to do as a matter of course. Uh, but yes, that's, that's one of the reasons why we want to get to the metadata, um, and, and also why the update framework is so interesting. Because. Okay, we'll have to cut it there. So, thank you very much, Nick. Thank you all.